So sometimes I put that video in at the end of the training. We've done it today at the beginning as a way of kind of setting the scene and getting people to think. Well, perhaps our challenge today is to think differently around self-harming behaviour. Um, but we wanted to start by acknowledging that it does have an impact on us as professionals. So what we wanted to start with was um, a word cloud um, to register what people's thoughts and feelings are when you think about self-harm. So there are some instructions on the screen there. You can either join at slido.com with the, um, the number that's on the screen, or you can use your phone to scan the QR code. So I don't know if people would like to do that and just have a think about the thoughts, the images that come into your mind when you think about self-harm, or perhaps if there's anything that the video has, um, has brought up for you what kind of things are coming up for people. So we've got ill mental health, misunderstood. Okay. Fantastic, yeah. So I can see a lot of comments there about what might be going on for the young person. What about our own feelings? So if somebody's written responsibility, I think that that's really helpful because we do feel responsible for the young people in our care. What what other feelings come up for us? Got something about getting it right there. Um, a few people saying that they're worried or, or worried about the young person. Uncertainty, feeling sad, feeling scared. So we've got a mixture of people's responses there and confused. Yeah, a really good one to have confused. Quite often um, the themes that come up are feelings of, of shock, feelings of being quite horrified by what that young person has done or, or feeling really confused about what to do and how to help them. And, and I often hear that people do feel a sense of responsibility um, that something has happened. And, and there's often that concern as well about, is it something that I've done wrong? Is it something that I could have pre prevented if I'd taken the right steps? And I think a lot of our procedures a lot of our um, protocols really do focus on preventing self-harm from happening in the first place in which case if somebody does hurt themselves then we do feel that's a failure of the system or perhaps one of uh, perhaps our own failure that something has happened um so we're going to try and shift the thinking a little bit from that um to see um to see self-harm in a different light don't want to anticipate everything joy's going to say in a minute but i don't want to lose these feelings either because it's really important that that we recognize that what we're bringing into our interactions with young people has an impact on that relationship an impact on that conversation um, and I think one of the young people in the video made the point about if I'm showing you something, if I'm telling you what's there or if I'm showing you on the surface what's there and you react with with horror or distress, I'm not going to be able to really talk about the feelings that are behind that, the things that are really going on that are very scary and might be very ugly or very, um, very horrific or that feel impossible to talk out for myself. But there's also the acknowledgement, again, you heard it in the video there, that we need support to deal with our own reactions. Actually, it can be quite traumatizing to witness somebody self-harming or to see the effects of the self-harm. So part of us being professional 
is to be able to present a helpful interaction for the young person, but knowing that our own feelings are going to be dealt with at another time, perhaps by a talk with colleagues, perhaps in supervision, if we're lucky enough to get supervision. Um, and it's really important to acknowledge the strength of these feelings. It is a really um, difficult um, difficult scenario to deal with. And we're, we're talking about words like desperation and helplessness, people feeling scared, people feeling worried. Um, so really important that we don't lose those and we need to hold on to our own feelings as well as the feelings that the young person might be having. So we're going to come back in a little while to strategies, but I think it's just really good to start. And as Annika was saying, we need to be aware that it's an emotive subject. We need to be able to look after ourselves and keep ourselves safe, both for our own mental health, but also to be effective in our interactions with young people. That's great. Thank you, Liz. And I think that was a really helpful introduction. Um, and what we're going to do now is just I'm going to share with you um, really a metaphor for understanding self-harm that we um, kind of use and emerge in our training and just to try and sort of help um, understand what's going on for young people, which is this idea of it being a coping strategy to help deal with the storms of life. And I noticed on that word cloud, um, a number of people put coping mechanism. And so, you know, just thinking about what are the kind of storms of life that young people are encountering? And um, we're just putting up a few words here just to give us some ideas. But, you know, really young people go through many things that are really Really difficult and um, some things you know around school and things that happen to them um, in school their experiences of school and um, things in their family and their personal life and um, things in their circumstances that are really hard um, and naturally when we're going through something difficult we 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 need something to kind of help us get through this and one of the things that um, I often kind of hear when we're talking about self-harm is that um it seems like this really kind of like big, scary thing. And it, and in some ways, yes, it is. But it, but when we understand it as a coping mechanism, we realise that actually we all have coping mechanisms, different coping strategies um, that we will deploy when we are going through something. So, um, you know, if you imagine that, you know, you've just had a really stressful day, you've had so many different priorities, you've had, you've got something also difficult going on at home, maybe you've got a relative that's sick, maybe you've got a child who's like causing you lots of stress at this, at this point, and, um, you know, and then your car breaks down, and then, and then you're just kind of like, oh my goodness, what on earth, um, and, um, and you need something to help you, don't you, kind of like, what can I, do, what can I do to make myself feel better, maybe I'm just going to get, um, fish and chips tonight and drink a, a big bottle of wine um maybe I'm just gonna <laughs> do you know what I mean maybe I'm just gonna like eat um eat all the chocolate or maybe when I'm like before my car broke down maybe I was having a bit of road rage because I was just venting um and actually these are the these are the kind of like these are our coping strategies um and some are a lot more socially acceptable than others and some are a lot more kind of like normalized than others but actually um self-harm is just another coping strategy it might be not the best one <laughs> because we know we know that it's not ideal but it is it is a coping mechanism and we all have them and so I think when we start to um think about it like this we can start to see that self-harm is like an umbrella in a storm that's and, it, and if we kind of like think about that metaphor so the other reason why we kind of in Emerge talk about self-harm as the kind of like coping umbrella is because it can be like an umbrella term as well, because I think we naturally think about self-injury when we think about self-harm. But actually, there's more to it than that. There's lots of different things that we might do um, that might be the that might be like a negative coping strategy, but that's what it is. So the first one can be about relationship with food, which we've already touched on. Um, so um Young people can have um, kind of like a, well, we all have an, an emotional connection with food, don't we? Um, it can be a huge comfort. Um, it can also, it can, and it can be complex emotionally. Um, actually, for me as a young person, when I was really stressed out at school, I used to restrict what I ate because it gave me a sense of control. 
Um, and so, uh, but for other people, it can be like, and sometimes more for me now, I'm like, I'm just going to eat all the crisps because I know it's not really good for me, but it's going to make me feel better in the moment and that's really what we're talking about here things that we know they're not the best it's not the best choice but it's going to help us to deal with our emotions on the inside and so our relationship with food can be really key in that so it can be about binging it can be about restricting it can involve purging um, and it can involve over exercise um, and I'm I know there's kind of like a whole crossover here with eating disorders and I'm not going to kind of get into that. Um, but just suffice to say that our relationship with food um, can kind of come within that self-harming umbrella. I hope that's OK. Um, the next one is uh, risky behaviour. So it can be about um, young people putting themselves in dangerous situations. So. Um, in Emerge, sometimes we find um, we, we're supporting people that have been found kind of like walking um, along the edge of a dual carriageway or like up on top of something high. And it's not because they necessarily thought that they were going to jump or whatever it was. It's just that they put themselves in that kind of physical situation that mirrored for them what was or expressed what was going on on the inside. It can also be around kind of like picking fights or kind of like having altercations either verbally or physically. Again, not necessarily because they've got a massive beef with the person that they're lashing out at, but because they just don't know what else to do with all of these feelings. And this seems like a natural outlet. It's like a coping strategy. But taking risks with drugs and alcohol, taking risks in terms of like our relationships um, with our hearts, essentially. You know, I'm just going to get into this situation with this person. I'm just going to go home with this person. I I know it's not, I know it's probably not the best thing, but it makes me feel, you know, like it makes me feel less alone. It makes me feel connected. It ma makes me feel um, special, um, even though actually maybe, it, maybe they don't treat me very nicely at other times, but I'm just going to do it anyway, because it's, it's this whole thing of like, I know it might not be the best thing, but I'm just going to do it anyway, because it meets this immediate need that I have. And then we've got taking risks online, which could be a whole session in itself. Um, but just to say it's kind of there within that umbrella. OK, then next we've got self-injury, which is the thing that we probably mostly think of when we come to think about self-harm. Um, it can be around cutting and that kind of thing, which, again, I think is what we normally think about. Um, what I would kind of say about that is that I think in the media, there tends to be a kind of stereotypical image of teenage girls that cut their arms and really want to show you. But actually, that's really um, not the case for most young people, that actually it's a really private thing. And that actually if somebody somebody else sees it, that's a really big deal. Um, and so if they're trusting you enough to let you see, then, um, you know, that take that that they're you know they they do really feel that they can trust you and that's a really good thing and we need to hold that really sensitively and really carefully um, and that actually a lot of young people if they are cutting they'll do it on parts of their body that other people are not going to normally see because it is quite a private thing it can also self-injury can also be around kind of like knocking into things punching walls kind of like causing like different types of injuries to their bodies which sometimes they can discover by accident I don't know if, if you've ever had it where you like bashed yourself and then you get a bit of like a surge of adrenaline um and that can kind of that that can kind of sometimes like alleviate some of the negative feelings that young people are experiencing in that storm yeah. and we've also got other things like burning and then we've got like compulsive things like um, hair pulling or picking that can kind of be a response to anxiety that people might not even really recognize as self-harm but you can see those behaviors escalate the more um, anxious a young person gets they'll be kind of doing um, doing that and so we need to be think, helping them to think what else could they do in those kind of situations and then lastly we've got self-poisoning um, and Actually, in Emerge, this is like the most common thing that we see when we're supporting um, young people in hospital. So overdoses of over-the-counter painkillers or medication that they found at home. And so what I always say when I train parents is it says on medicine, keep out of the sight and reach of small children. This is like keep out of the sight and reach of all children, especially teenagers, because they are impulsive creatures. Um, and actually, if they have to go searching for something, if it's 
blocks away, then that gives them 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes just to have another idea, maybe to calm down a little bit, maybe for an adult to realise there's a problem. Whereas if there's stuff just lying around that they can pick up and put in their pocket, then we don't have that opportunity to intervene. Um, again, self-poisoning with drugs or alcohol um, or ingesting kind of um, toxic substances, that kind of thing. And so I don't know what your reactions have been as I've kind of talked through some of these things. Like it might have been a bit of like, a, oh, my goodness, this is really scary. But let's just keep in mind that this is just a young person's way of coping with their storm. Um, it doesn't mean that they've got a mental illness or that they're even particularly unstable. It's just the thing that they found that helps them cope in that moment. Um, and what we need to do is to try and help them to find a better umbrella because we can't always change the weather, can we? As much as we might wish we could, we can't always change the circumstances, but we can help them to find a better umbrella. Uh, hi, guys. Um, so I started self-harming when I was in year eight or year nine, I think. Um, and for me, it was a way of coping with all these different emotions that I was having. Um, at the time, I didn't know that I was actually autistic and have ADHD. Um, so for me, the world was terrifying. It was, I felt alone and just completely isolated with what I was feeling. I obviously didn't have, wasn't great at friendships at school. Um, I just felt very different. Um, then it started going into, I did experience some trauma in my younger years. Um, and then it kind of all escalated. My physical self-harm, so my cutting, actually reduced when I got an eating disorder because that is just a different way that I coped with these emotions was my eating disorder. I didn't need to physically self-harm because at the time, I was having a different form of coping. Um, and for me, the way I would describe self-harm is like, how many of you smoke? If you smoke, that is just your way of coping. My way of coping when I was younger was cutting myself. I did do that for many years, um, which I do regret now, but I can't change it. And I actually learned a lot about myself and everything whilst I was going through that I met Emerge when I was 17 just about to turn 18 when Emerge actually first started um going into hospitals um because I did also try and take my own life a few times um but to me no one understood the self-harm and self-harm sounds very scary I remember when my mum found out that I was self-harming and it was like absolute chaos I tried to hide it for as long as possible I hid it from like everybody until I couldn't anymore because it did become dangerous but there are many different coping strategies that I have tried and what I have to say is all like one shoe does not fit all if that makes sense so for me I mean, I tried various different coping mechanisms. I went through various different therapies and that's when I found that like only certain things work for me and that's okay. Most people will try and force things on you and then say that you're resistant to the, uh, the help that they're giving you. But everyone is different and everyone's brain works different. So, different, so you've got to work with the person especially you've got to get to know them in order to help them my biggest help was when someone actually sat down and went screw everything that every other service has said about you what's happened what's gone on and they sat down with me for a good few hours and actually went through everything in my life without looking at various different notes that people had written about me and that's when they were like actually wait a second you're autistic there's like there's no word of a lie you're autistic that's why nothing else has worked for your brain necessarily because your brain has a different way of wiring so we need to work on different strategies for that and I was lucky enough that actually that came along and really helped me Emerge also really helped me by just being my 
by helping change my umbrella, we'll use that term. But also being a bit of like, the storm got so big, I was drowning in a flood and they just tossed me a life ring and they were like, you, you can stay there. We've got the life for it. Like you've got your little buoyancy aid. Just stay with us for a bit. And like every now and again, like they would like reel me in a little bit and I would, it just like bit by bit by bit. It took a while, a good few years, but eventually I was out on dry land and didn't need those nasty coping mechanisms anymore that were harming me. One question that we often kind of like hear or sense from professionals or from parents or just in general around this whole subject of self-harm is but it's really just attention seeking right and and that can kind of come with a therefore we're going to dismiss it or therefore you know it doesn't seem so you know like this this young person just needs to stop this like they just need to stop creating so much drama they just need to follow their safety plan they just need to like whatever it is um but what we try and do and and even like when it when sometimes this this question rises up in in us um is to try and reframe it as attention needing um and so what i mean by that is saying you know what, if this young person really was totally fine and had no problem, why would they do this? They wouldn't, would they? Um, so so let's just kind of like get get that sort of like straight out there. Because if they were perfectly fine, they'd just go and enjoy their life. Like they they wouldn't be like constantly kind of like coming back with with this um or or doing this behavior it's but it's a symptom it's not a it's not a thing nobody gets diagnosed with self-harm um it's a symptom of a problem it's their coping strategy so what we need to do is to think what is the real underlying need that this young person is trying to draw attention to through this behavior? What is it that they're, tr- what, what is it that they really need us to pay attention to? And how can we do that in the way that they need it? So rather than necessarily like responding to the behavior or the kind of coping strategy that they're displaying, we need to kind of go, okay, what is it that you really need? Like what's underneath this? How can we help you in the moment? But also how can we help you in the longer term um, to really kind of like, yeah, to find that different kind of coping umbrella um, so that you don't feel the need to do these things that, um, you know, that are hurting you, that are really risky, that are really distressing. And so it's kind of coming at it with that kind of compassionate approach of going you know, it, it just sounds to me as though you're having such a like such a difficult time at the moment that you f- that you feel the need to do this. And I'm so sorry to hear that. And like, what can we do? How can we help? What do you need? Um, and just kind of coming coming at it like that, if that makes sense. Cool. And then the, the, the second part of that is about helping them to find a more positive coping umbrella. So we've got a um a, a more kind of like cheerfully coloured umbrella here and Annika's just putting up some suggestions and I know Liz is going to talk um, in a little bit as well about some of the things that can help but these are just some ideas um, of different types of things that can help young people to express these negative emotions and these kind of like difficult and painful emotions and thoughts in a, in a like less risky way so that they can have a more positive coping umbrella. So one of my favourites on here is about creative expression. And so I'll just explain that one. Um, often we kind of think that like we might need to, um, I don't know, be able to play an instrument or be able to draw really well in order to use kind of a creative expression but actually it's just doing anything that takes what's on the inside that's all kind of like bunched up on the inside and just gets it out and so it can be something as simple as getting a piece of paper and a big black sharpie scribbling all over it writing some words on it if there's swear words we're fine with that just get it all down there and then like tear up that piece of paper screw it up in a ball and chuck it in the bin you know or like that kind of thing so it's just getting what's inside out but doing it in a way that's not hurting them or not hurting anybody else or things like um making a load of ice cubes and just chucking them at the patio um that type of thing where it's just yeah it, it gets it out and you know if that person is a musician or an artist fantastic they can they can create a masterpiece but actually there's creative things that we can all do that can that can just get it out get these things out but in a 
in a more positive way. And the other thing I just want to pick up on is talking, because I think that's the thing that we all default to, well, let's talk about it. And for some young people, that's like super hard and really intimidating and that they just don't know how to go about it. And so one of the things that we often find is really helpful, and I'm sure you guys know this, is like to do something whilst chatting just and, and to keep it like low pressure. So like playing a game, doing some colouring, going for a walk, do, whatever it is, like fiddling with stuff and allowing the young person to guide that conversation. Because although we might want answers to questions we've got, or we might be trying to get to the bottom of things, we have to go at their pace and allow them to guide the conversation. So we might start off talking about really random superficial things like YouTube videos of cats or like whatever it is, <laughs> you know, and allow that young person to warm up into the conversation um, and beat you at Uno for a while and like just feel comfortable and then when they want to share then that then that's great but then at some point they might go okay that feels like we've gone far enough now let's just now talk about um cats again and we have to go with them like we can't kind of like keep on trying to bring it back to the thing that we needed to talk to them about um and then over time it'll get easier and easier for them to share um, like I said in the video, like what's on the inside, that stuff that feels really confusing. Um, and actually, a lot of the time, don't even really understand it themselves. <laughs> they can't articulate it. Um, so it's just about being that kind of safe space to just explore and gradually open things up kind of like when they're ready, really. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, th I think one of the things that comes up most frequently is what if I say the wrong thing? And I think there is a real fear that um, if we introduce the idea of self-harm or if we mention suicide, then we will be putting ideas into a young person's head and then we will be responsible or we will be at fault somehow if they go on to act on those ideas. Um, and I think it's really important to start by saying that we won't be suggesting anything to that young person that they haven't already thought about, that they haven't already been exposed to in TV, if young people watch TV anymore, on YouTube clips, on, on documentaries, on um, by talking to their peers. The idea is out there already. So you won't be introducing that idea to young people. But what I'd like to sort of point out is that if the risk is there, it's there anyway. And it's better that we find out that it's there by asking the right questions rather than just kind of keep it hidden and, and don't don't mention it at all. And it may be that you are the first person who has allowed that young person to express it, has allowed to allowed them to say yes, actually, that is in my head and it's really scary. Or yes, actually, I have been thinking about doing this because things are so bad and I, I haven't been able to let anybody know just how bad they are. So you won't be putting ideas into people's heads. It's never an unhelpful thing to be able to put things clearly. And I've said down there as well that it's especially important to be clear and unambiguous. And if we are working with young people who are on the, um, the spectrum, it's really useful to use words that are very, very clear. So if we talk to a young person on the spectrum about, um, are you thinking of doing something stupid? then that might mean to them, well, putting on a silly hat and dancing there around the room, it could mean anything at all. It could be putting your shoes on before you put your socks on. Um, so really important that we're really clear about it. There was uh, um, some training that I went to by Autism Oxford a little while ago um, where a young person had taken their life, sadly, and they had been asked about their thoughts, but at the time and the environment they'd been asked about, it was an environment in a one-to-one -one situation where they felt very uncomfortable, um, very exposed to lots and lots of um, stimuli that were very overwhelming for them. Um, so actually their concern at that point in time hadn't been about um, taking their lives or about suicidal thoughts. It had been more about dealing with the environment they were finding themselves in at that particular moment. So we need to be really careful about our language. Um, I've said there as well, and kind of touching on what I said at the beginning, 
try not to react with horror or panic, even if that's what we're feeling. But that does impact on that young person um, and how comfortable they're going to be to share anything else with you. So it's important that we acknowledge, yes, that's what I'm feeling, but that's not what I'm going to bring to this conversation. What this young person needs is for me to, to be calm um, and to be receptive to what they're trying to say. Um, I've just put there as well that speaking with kindness is never the wrong thing. Um, and as, as Joy was saying earlier, what I quite like to start um, my conversations with is an acknowledgement of what's behind the, the self-harm. So acknowledging that that young person might just be really upset or going through a really difficult time. And sometimes it's quite nice just to be able to say thank you for letting me know that that's how bad things are for you at the moment. Thank you for, for letting me know how difficult things are just at this moment. So that can be a nice um, conversation starter, or even just asking that young person to tell you a little bit about what's going on for them um, can be a good way to open the conversation. So um, I put at the bottom, and I, I guess that's the, the whole thrust of the session we're doing today, that young people will use, or, and in fact adults as well, use self-harm as a way of coping with feelings that can be really difficult and unbearable or overwhelming. So what we're looking to do is to help them to manage those feelings in a, in a more productive and less harmful way. What we're not trying to do is take away control. We don't want somebody to come in and say to that young person, you must stop this now. I'm going to prevent you from, from doing anything further without helping them to find another way of coping. Otherwise, we leave them with nothing. And the risk then is that the, they will find something else to do, which may be even more harmful. So it's my, and, and Jazz made the point earlier as well, that we need to work with young people. We need to work with them as individuals. So actually allowing them to make decisions about their own care and their own coping strategies is going to be much more effective than trying to impose something on them. Yeah. First of all, I want to go back to what Liz was saying. Um, I think another way to say it is just be human. Don't be a brick wall. You need people need to know that you're not just another professional that's going to sit there and give them the same lecture that they've heard 10 times by another professional. We know it. People who have been self-harming for a while, they know it. They know what they need to do, but it's clearly not working. They can't be human show some empathy talk to them like not like a friend but less professional and less like with your notebook out and your notes just take a moment to talk to them like anyone else like a family member almost um that's what I have to say on that but Chinese whispers the obviously you all remember playing I don't know have you all played Chinese whispers in school and you go around and you the end sentence is nothing like what the first person said or there's like bits of it what I have experienced within services and especially like if you go into A&E for example and or someone's brought you into A&E um, and all of a sudden someone else comes in and goes oh in your notes it said xyz and I've been sat there going who said that that's not me what what are you going on about and because they've just assumed that the notes is like the bible and it's just like is what it is that's what it says that's what must have happened when that's not always true people get it wrong you come out of a session and you start writing your notes about the session but you can't remember exactly what has been said but, and or you think you do but you've misunderstood and then all of a sudden it goes down another person then down another person down another person all of a sudden you're sat there someone else is sat there talking to talking to them and going oh well like you said this what this is like years ago and so no I didn't know I I didn't and I felt that way in services for so long I got taken up to adult services and all of a sudden it's like oh well you know this has happened over like this many years and this is what's happened like most recently and it's oh well, you've said this 
and it's like no I, I didn't exactly say that this is what I meant this is how I was feeling that's wrong but because it's in your notes it's there forever literally people go there and they're like oh well this is what it says and it's so difficult to get that then taken out of your notes even now I go into my NHS notes and it says BPD and automatically I am deemed as an attention seeker when actually that diagnosis got taken off when and I sat down with a new service when I got transferred and they ignored the notes completely they were like we don't want to see these notes we actually want to see you as a person I cried with relief when I sat down there because I was like, I don't feel like I'm going to die anymore in the most, like, I'm not being dramatic in that sense. Like, I genuinely felt there may actually be a way here for someone to listen to what I am actually saying instead of what someone else has written about me. Because it's my story, it's what I'm going through. It's not people's interpretation of what, I've said or gone through so when they sat down and then they listened to my entire long story that was like eight years long and it did take a while obviously because it's it was years of people assuming about me then they were like oh no that's that's not right at all I don't know why they've like assumed this or what's gone on or what's been traveled through this amount of time but that's not true like you don't seem this way at all like this is actually what's wrong with you and that's when they were like oh you're autistic your brain works differently that's why you're overwhelmed these are the coping mechanisms we can give you this way and it was so refreshing because the Chinese whispers was broken and then someone listened to me and actually like sat there with me and she almost like double checked everything that then she wrote down because and she gave me a way of saying it as well like I would I was never very good at talking about my feelings I know that may shock some of you now because I am wittering on about my life but in the moment I was never very good at expressing how I was feeling so I would write everything down because I wrote everything down it that was just scanned into my notes and it was there so nothing could be misinterpreted some people don't like doing that but if they like drawing put that in their notes obviously you've got to ask for permission or whatever but put anything that they have like actually done in their notes so nothing can be misinterpreted because it's so dangerous and demoralizing to just be assumed that you're whatever someone else has said about you and it's just it was so irritating for years and that's why I felt so misunderstood so I wanted to start really by by going back to what Jazz said in, in the first time you were speaking and that um, things don't work the same for every single person. And the most important thing you can do is sit down with that person and think with them about what works for them. I think very often um, I get calls or I get inquiries from people saying, I know about ice cubes, I know about rubber bands, but what else can I suggest as a strategy? And I think it's... It, it's um, it's not helpful to try and get caught up on there is this magic strategy that will work for people um, because different things will work for, for different people. So it don't take everything as being um, as being set in stone, even the things that I'm su suggesting, they are ideas. Um, people who are familiar with the MindWork safety plan as well, I think one of the things that often um, trips people up on that is that they feel they have to come with all the strategies and actually the point of the safety plan is that it's worked out with the young person and we work with what um, what works for them and also that it's reviewed on a regular basis that you go back to it um, and say well you had this incident last week did that strategy work for you or do we need to think about something different? And I have to acknowledge as well, I know, Jazz, you really don't like the word, the term safety plan. Please don't feel that you have to keep to that terminology. You're welcome to take them and use them in whatever way is helpful to you and the young person. But what I've done here is I've just done three slides and I've talked about cathartic strategies, about mindful strategies and about sensory strategies. 
um, just to give you a few ideas about what what kind of things might be helpful for that young person. But it is the chance to be creative, if you like. It is the chance to think about what does what function does the self harm fulfil for that young person? Is it um, is it that they're feeling angry and needing to do something really physical um, to get rid of that excess energy? In which case, how do we challenge that in a different way? So you might find that what works for somebody is, is as people have suggested, writing everything down. Jazz was talking about writing things down. That can be really cathartic. So a cathartic uh, um, intervention is about um, a release of emotions. Um, and that's what we're aiming for with these. Oh, and I've lost my slides. Uh, so think about um, think about what might work for that particular person that you're working with. But it might be something that requires a lot of energy. It might be something um, that um, helps them by getting getting rid of of those emotions by doing something very very physical. Or if we move on to the next slide, if we think about um, the kind of strategies that might be um, more mindful. And I've put down some things here about um, putting your feelings into a song or a poem, um, doing some breathing exercises. Lots of these things you can find on the web. Many, many people find it really helpful just to get outside and go into nature, spend some time in a green space or doing something that's a self-care activity. Um, so, again, you know, not all of these things will suit all of your young people, but they might find something in there that works for them. So the third slide that I've got is just about the sensory strategies. And this is, again, particularly if I'm thinking about um, young people who might be on the autism spectrum. Um, uh, often we find that those are the young people who are getting over, overwhelmed with different kinds of sensory input. So you might have a young person who's really sensitive to the noise and busyness of a classroom or of a particular environment. And what they need perhaps is, to, is something to help them to, to focus or to screen out that noise and that busyness. Um, so I've got, well, I've put down four senses here. You can include taste if you like. Taste is always a, a bit of a challenging one in schools because um, it depends really on, on what's acceptable within the classroom. Some young people like to have particular objects to chew on. You can find um, uh, kinds of chew toys if that's something that's, um, that's helpful to that young person or perhaps a particular flavour or taste is helpful for them. Um, particular smells can be can be very provoking. Certainly, I know of a, a young person I worked with in a, in a school quite recently. The teaching assistant had changed her perfume and couldn't figure out why the relationship that had worked really, really well had suddenly fallen apart with the young person. But it, particular smells can be very, um, very difficult, very evocative for some people. Um, but in the same way, um, you might find a particular scent really soothing. So I've used lavender bags with, with young people very successfully. Again, it doesn't work for everybody. Some people might find that a terrible, terrible smell. Mm. But there might be things that you can touch, things that you can um, squeeze. If what you're wanting is the physical sensation of something like cutting within the self-harm, you can find something to squeeze. When I was a, a child, we used to use things like stickle bricks. I don't know if people still have those, but something with a rough texture that you can squeeze that will give you that same physical sensation that people might need in order to ground themselves, um, but won't be actually doing any physical damage or any harm. And it's the same idea with, with the ice cubes that we use. Lots of schools, lots of activities will allow you to use headphones. Again, depends on your school, depends on your, on your teachers, perhaps, whether that's an acceptable thing to do in class. Um, and they're seeing, again, you might need to think about where a young person is sitting within a classroom or within a within a, a room that they're meeting in. If there's a really strong light coming through, if there are really um, powerful overhead lights or, or lights that are buzzing, those might be things that you need to think about. There'll be all kinds of things within the world that perhaps us as neurotypical people won't even notice that can be really, really um troubling to somebody who's neurodiverse. So the important thing about the strategies is not 
making a list of everything and having some kind of um um some kind of list that's all inclusive that contains every single strategy that'll work um in in the whole history of humankind it's about sitting down with that young person and thinking about what works with them and we do this in advance of a crisis we do this at a time when things are calm when they can think about what really helps them because as we know if we try to intervene when a young person is in crisis the the way that young people's brains develop they're going to be in fight or flight mode and they just won't be able to do that thinking at that time of crisis so it's really useful to have thought about this in advance and then review it at a time when things have calmed down a bit so essentially what we're trying to do is delay um, the urge to self-harm we're trying to put it off and trying to give give people something they can do instead that perhaps fulfills the same purpose, but does it in a less harmful way. So we're trying to anything, and Joy mentioned earlier about making it difficult to find tablets, making it difficult to find implements of self-harm. So anything that gives a little bit of space for, um, for those feelings to start to subside um, is a helpful thing to do. And what we're trying to do is delay that, um, that feeling that you need to self-harm and perhaps find other things to do that, that can provide the same function, but without, um, without causing any damage. Um, but I think maybe the thing to finish on is just to come back to you, Jazz, and to say, I don't know if there were things particularly that helped you um, when you were feeling the urge to self-harm, particular strategies that you found helpful, or maybe things that you didn't find helpful. Yeah, so um, um, for me, it was, I needed someone who kind of understood my triggers, per se. Um, I had different, like, this sounds really weird, but I had different cards. I had like a, a green card. I couldn't find them. I was going to bring them. Had a green card that was like, I'm okay. Everything's good. Just we can talk about whatever, I'm I'm fine. Had a yellow card or an orange card that was like, I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. I'm starting to feel the urge. Let's play a game to distract myself. That's when the distraction techniques were most helpful was when I'm like kind of walking towards the edge. It was like games. We'll watch TV series that I like. Mine's Grey's Anatomy binged it about eight times um or taking the dog for a walk with someone with me but also if I was taking my dog for a walk I'm not gonna do anything because I love my dog like he's my son um and then we had the red card that was like SOS I am not okay I need someone with me this was a don't leave me alone or write let me write everything down because I found it took a while for me to get to that point of letting someone in but once that happened it was like red card I'm I'm on the edge like I'm tipping over the edge don't leave me I need to talk to somebody I was lucky enough to be able to text my care coordinator they had phones and I could text her so I would text her being like I need help like can we jump on a call I don't feel safe it was then okay do you want to talk to your mum because actually near the end of my experience I found a lot of support in my mum at start at the start I was like I'm never talking to my mum Joy's gonna nod here so I'm not talking to my mum. I don't want to do this. No, my mum doesn't exist. I, I don't care. But actually now I'm like, mum, I need you. <laughs> and I will just, I got to that point. It was also things like, okay, we'll start doing the tip sort of strategies from DVT um, that was like temperature. I can't remember the rest of them. That's so bad. Liz will, it is like the whole touch situation I would hold an ice cube or for me it was something soft so I had this like one teddy bear that also my dad would spray his cologne on 
and that would give me some sort of like emotional response where I genuinely felt like my flight or flight response had settled down and I could just take a moment to then be able to think and that's when like I would probably tip back into the orange and be like okay now it's just distractions and that time would pass it is I hated someone saying just ride the wave just ride the wave you'll be all right no I'm not all right because it's a tidal wave and I'm drowning I'm not just gonna be fine if I ride the wave like that's not okay um but yeah for me it was gay like it's so difficult because different things worked at different times and there was a time when I was so unresponsive to everything or actually not even unresponsive I just wouldn't try because I didn't care I was in the moment of "Mm, it's what it is I'm gonna do it anyway who cares um I also did try the wait five minutes put a timer on sit there put time on for two minutes and just sit there and don't do anything for two minutes. If you get to the two minutes, why don't you try restarting that timer for another two minutes? And then the next day it's like, oh, why didn't you try doing the timer for five minutes? And then that grows and grows and grows until you can kind of stop the, stop the urge straight away and you can kind of sit with it for a bit longer. 